Welcome to the candidate forum for the Illinois House of Representatives 17th District Candidates with the Honorable Jennifer Gong Gershowitz and candidates Yeso Yoon and Christopher Kruger. My name is Riaz Galani and I am the MC for today's event. I'm currently in my second year as a special education teacher in the 17th District where I've lived my entire life. Today's program is proudly being presented to you by the Ismaili Jamatkana and Center. Through the guidance of His Highness the Aga Khan, the 49th hereditary Imam of the Shia Ismaili Muslims, the Ismaili Jamatkanas in the United States are more than places of worship and spiritual search. They are places of friendship, dialogue, and inclusivity, reaching out to neighbors to facilitate an exchange of ideas. This is achieved through hosting cultural programs such as educational seminars and lectures, art exhibitions, music and dance, and as a forum for civic leaders and others. At the opening ceremony of the new headquarters of the Global Center for Pluralism on May 16th, 2017, the Aga Khan explained, and I quote, pluralism does not mean the elimination of difference, but the embrace of difference. Genuine pluralism understands that diversity does not weaken us as a society, it strengthens it. In an ever shrinking, ever more diverse world, a genuine sense of pluralism is the indispensable foundation for human peace and progress." End quote. These spaces hope to encourage community engagement and collaboration on issues of concern, as well as broadening intellectual horizons and fostering an appreciation of pluralism. Today's session is no exception. The questions for our session will be moderated by Noreen Hashem. Noreen is a policy and communications advisor for Cook County, Illinois, the second most populous county in the country. Her focus involves overseeing the county's criminal justice, economic development, pension, and women's issue commissions. She's also a master's in public policy and administration candidate. Her previous experiences include managing various local campaigns, fundraising, and outreach roles. She also sits on various volunteer boards, including the Interfaith Ministries of Greater Houston Young Professionals Board, Illinois Muslim Civic Association, Young American Leaders, ISERVE, Cook County's Justice Advisory Council, and the Women and Girls Commission. Without further ado, Please enjoy the program. Thank you for the introduction. We'd like to begin the session by introducing the Honorable Jennifer Gong Gershowitz, Illinois State Representative for the 17th District. Jennifer has been a determined fighter for the voiceless and vulnerable her entire li adult life. She is the granddaughter of Chinese immigrants who fought deportation under the Chinese Exclusion Acts. As a lawyer at Winston and Strawn, Jennifer partnered with the National Immigrant Justice Center to aggressively defend the rights of unaccompanied immigrant children. She fought and won in federal court to protect victims of child trafficking and forced marriage. Jennifer was the first American lawyer to earn a master's degree in international human rights law from Northwestern University, publishing her research on gendered war crimes in the Northwestern Journal of Human Rights. In her first term as state representative for the 17th district, Jennifer passed legislation to protect our community's most vulnerable immigrants, including children separated from their parents during the immigration enforcement and abused, abandoned, or neglected children who require state court findings to be eligible for this special immigrant juvenile visa. Jennifer currently resides in Glenview with her husband and their three sons. Welcome representative. I want to go ahead and jump right into the questions. If re-elected to office, what will be your top priorities and what do you think is the most pressing issue for Springfield that needs to be addressed by the governor or the Illinois legislature? Well, first of all, thank you all so much for having me. It's an honor to be with you. Um, so you asked about my top priorities. As uh, someone who has spent my entire professional life working to protect the most vulnerable, fighting for human rights and social justice. I am someone who believes strongly that our job in the legislature is to ensure that we level the playing field and make sure that the same ladders to success that were available to my family are available to everyone. 
So my goal is to continue my work to ensure that Illinois remains a safe and a welcoming state for immigrants. As you mentioned in the introduction, I spent the past 20 years representing the most vulnerable among us in the immigrant population. I took on cases involving unaccompanied immigrant children and in my first term passed three bills to provide humanitarian protections for immigrants in our community. In my next term, I will continue that fight to make sure that everyone has equal access to education, to high quality health care. Those are my top priorities. It's what I've worked on my whole life. And those are the things that I plan to continue to fight for moving forward in my second term. Thank you, Representative, for sharing that feedback. Um, you know, along those lines, Illinois is continuing down the path of unfunded pension liabilities. In fact, a recent report from Moody's estimates that the liability may spike to over $260 billion. What should Illinois lawmakers do about it? And what specific steps do you support to control state pension costs? Well, thank you for that question. Pensions are something that I get asked about a lot. Um, as, as you know, um, our pension, our current uh, unfunded pension liability took over 40 years to develop. And so anyone that says that there is a simple solution is either misinformed or is being disingenuous. This is a complex problem that does not lend itself to a simple solution. The most important thing that we can do to address our unfunded pension liability is to make our pension payment in full every single year, which is a measure, frankly, that the General Assembly failed to take for the previous decades that have, that have lent us or put us in the situation we're in now. The next thing that we need to do is to uh, work on consolidating uh, the pension systems that we have in our state. Um, I voted to consolidate over 250 police and fire pensions into two statewide funds so that we can take advantage of economies of scale and also reduce the overhead and administrative costs. So those two things are the single most important things that we can do to address our unfunded pension liability. Thank you for sharing that. I think you, you hit on some very important things. Um, you know, again, continuing some of that conversation, public pension funds are paid but for by the taxpayers. And that remains one of the top reasons that people are li leaving Illinois. In fact, over the last decade, more than 80, 850,000 people have left for other states, causing the state's population to shrink for six consecutive years. What role do you believe the state plays in retaining its residents through job creation and economic opportunity and stemming the exodus of people from Illinois? Um, well, before I get started on economic development, I obviously have a lot of thoughts on that. I just want to correct and make one thing clear about our pension system. And that is that our pension system is not an entitlement. It is a contractual obligation and one that public employees pay into throughout their careers. So it is the retirement system for state employees. Uh, in tier, uh, tier two was passed in 2011, which moved people to uh, what is a far less generous uh, pension than uh, those who are currently enrolled in tier one. Um, and I just want to make clear that this is something um, that is part of a defined benefit plan that uh, people pay into throughout their careers. Um, but as far as economic development, I think one of the single you know, most important uh, things that we can do is ensure that we shore up the small business community in our state. Um, small business owners provide uh, jobs and economic opportunity. Most of the people who live in my district work for small businesses. So it's incredibly important to me that we continue to support the small business community as we try to recover from this unprecedented uh, health crisis that we find ourselves in battling COVID-19. One of the things that I have done is to support the business interruption grants at the state level, which provide grants of up to $150,000 for small businesses impacted by the pandemic. Another thing that I have done is to introduce the small business tax credit, which is House Bill 4823, that would provide a $5,000 tax incentive to all small businesses who create new full-time jobs. 
So it's not only an incentive for businesses, but also is a job creation measure. I, I have also supported the Illinois Small Business Emergency Loan Fund, as well as the downstate and suburban small business stabilization programs. These programs are vital investments in our small business community, which we know are the back backbone of our economy here in Illinois, not only uh, in our communities here in the 17th district, but throughout the state. Thank you, Representative, again, for, for kind of helping me along with this discussion, um, you know, kind of following up on, on what you mentioned earlier, which is that we're living through a pandemic and it's only worsened the social and economic inequities that we've always had. Specifically, the health crisis has widened inequities for people of color and other historically marginalized communities. Earlier this month, Governor J.B. Pritzker and Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton announced the Healing in Illinois Initiative in response to the racial disparities. What are, what are other steps that you think the state should take, if any, to address this widening gap? Well, thank you for that question. This is um, something that I have devoted most of my professional life uh, to trying to achieve social and economic justice. And as you just said, uh, human rights and social justice are not just about political rights. It's also about economic justice and human dignity. It's about ensuring that each and every one of us has the ladders to success and the opportunity to succeed. I believe that our our budget is a moral document. It's an expression of our values. So when we allocate resources, the question that we ought to be asking is how can we do the most good for the most people? That has been my goal uh, as a member of the uh, House Human Services Appropriations Committee. Our goal is to work towards equal access to a high quality education, healthcare, and economic opportunities for communities that have been disproportionately impacted by racial injustice. Thank you for that comment. Um, our next question is, one of the most contested items on the ballot for Illinois this year is the Illinois Allow for Graduated Income Tax Amendment, which is a proposed amendment to change the state's income tax system from a flat tax to a graduated tax. For residents, this would mean higher tax rates for those who have higher incomes. Do you support this measure and how do you justify your position? Well, first I wanna clear up a few misconceptions about the fair tax because there's been a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, so I wanna take this opportunity to remind everyone that uh, under the proposal, um, which is on the ballot, um, all commonly known as the fair tax, 97% of Illinoisans would pay the same or less. And this is also true for most small business owners because most small business owners do not net more than 250,000 in taxable income because they reinvest into their businesses to grow their businesses. So again, I wanna reiterate that 97% of Illinoisans, and that includes our small business owners, would be paying the same or less under a graduated income tax, also known as the fair tax. The fair tax does not tax retirement income. What it does do is it would provide funding for the things that we know are so important to our communities like healthcare and education. The fair tax is simply a graduated income tax like we have at the federal level and in the vast majority of states. So I think it's incredibly important that we see it for what it is. And I would encourage all of you to go to the governor's website and search the fair tax calculator, which can tell you what this would mean for your families. Thank you for that resource. Um, we'll be sure to, to make sure that we, we get that up, out there. Um, the last question that I've got for you is, we're seeing a national phenomenon of increasingly polarized and partisan narratives on almost every position. In Illinois, we have 118 members in the Illinois State House who's, who come from various parties and ideologies. How do, you, how do you currently and how will you reach across the aisle to find common ground and come to agreements on critical issues that impact all of your constituents? So this is one of the most important things um, I view uh, in my job in public service is to make sure that we are always working together with a common goal in mind. 
We are all uh, Illinoisans, and it's my responsibility to ensure that all voices are heard and all voices are represented. And I take that responsibility very seriously. And so I just want to give you one example of my work in the General Assembly that I think is reflective of that commitment to bipartisanship. So when I went down to Springfield as a freshman legislator in 2018, uh, it was first time uh, on the House floor, and I had been working on a bill from my experience working with the immigrant community over the last two decades. It's a bill that's near and dear to my heart, House Bill 836, which provides um, protections for families um, who want to make sure that there is a guardian in place for their children in the event that they are detained or deported by immigration enforcement. It uh, was a bill that uh, I had been working on prior to coming into the General Assembly, and it was important to me that we pass it with bipartisan support. So I went and I talked to uh, the House Republican Minority Leader, Jim Durkin. I told him about my goals for the bill, why I thought this was so important for Illinois, and how it would work to accomplish the goal of protecting immigrant children in our state. Not only did he support my bill, he became the chief co-sponsor of my bill. So I passed my first uh, bill, immigration bill, in the Illinois General Assembly, not only with bi broad bipartisan support, but with Republican chief co-sponsors from, uh, from leadership. So for me, um, that is the, the, I think, most concrete example that I can give of my work to reach across the aisle on issues that a lot of people feel are incredibly partisan. Um, you know, people were surprised to learn that I was able to pass immigration bills with bipartisan support. And that's about building trust, building relationships and having conversations. Thank you, Representative, for that conversation. Um, you know, just to close our conversation out for today, I want to invite you to take a couple of minutes to share any closing remarks that you might want with our audience today. Well, first of all, I just wanna thank the Ismaili community for everything that you do for our community. I am so grateful for the work that you have done to improve the well-being and improve the quality of life for the people living in our community. I know that in these unprecedented times, it was the Ismaili community that stepped up to organize volunteers, to organize food drives, to deliver masks and PPE to our community. These are the values that make our community a special place to live in. It's the values that have defined my life and career and the reason why I am running to be reelected to the 17th district. It has been my honor to represent you in Springfield. I would be honored to have your support so that we can continue to work together to ensure that everyone in our community has a voice. And thank you for all that you do every day. Thank you so much, Representative, for joining us today. We'll go on to our next candidate. Next, I'd like to introduce candidate Yeso Yoon. Yeso has been serving as a human relations commissioner at the village of Skokie. She received her master's degree in public administration from DePaul University. She is also the host of Global Leaders Network on Win TV, a public channel 24, and enjoys opera singing. Welcome, Ms. Yoon. I'll move right into the questions. Hello, Hello. everybody. Nice to meet you. First question, if elected to office, what will be your top priorities and what do you think is the most pressing issue that needs to be addressed by the governor or the Illinois legislature? Yeah, that's really a good question. Um, well, first of all, I would like to eliminate the debts. So Illinois has one of the highest tax rate uh, in the nation and state is drowning uh, in debt and high taxes are out of control. And we have to really eliminate the root cause of our, you know, our control spending. And in order to do that, uh, we have to work really hard and do some of the work um, so that people, they don't need to move out and they can do their business in and Illinois can become desirable state to live and work in. And the second of all, uh, I also would like to solve the problem with the Weed Productive Health Act, which allows abortion up to birth, nine months. I know the Quran, Hadith, according to Hadith, uh, the Quran uh, 17 verse 32 says that uh, killing innocent lives is great sin. Uh, killing these baby is not going to be, you know, fun, it's not going to be right, okay? It's, it's a serious murder and we have to protect these 
infants and that's why I decided to run and my opponent just co-sponsored the bill uh, last year uh, reproductive health act it's not about our choice it's we also have to think about our innocent lives and it's two parties and I would like to generate better atmosphere for our citizens we you know, recommending ultrasound adoption and foster care. And lastly, I would like to protect our citizen and also defend our police and protect our business. Thank you so much for your response. And, you know, you actually just mentioned a couple of things that I'll touch on. Um, one of which is, you know, Illinois does continue down the path of unfunded pension liabilities. In fact, a recent report from Moody's estimates that the liability may spike to over $260 billion. What do you think Illinois lawmakers should do about this, if anything? And what specific steps do you support to control the state pension costs? Yeah, that's really good question. The problem, we have to know the root cause, okay? The, the problem was of uh, the pension debt is politicians actually grant workers overly generous pension benefits that taxpayers can no longer afford. So that's the big problem. And, uh, and second of all, uh, the, there should be a retirement age. Social Security benefit until you know age 67, there should be guideline. But right now, 60% of state workers retire in their 50s and also with the full benefit that will cause a lot of a debt problem uh, to our, our states. And the lastly, um, I think that I believe that cost of living adjustment, which is COLA, uh, annual 3% compounded boost to their pension will, you know, um, will cause more deaths to our states. And I think that we have to take a, a, a action as soon as possible. The, the solution is very simple. Uh, in order to reduce this, we have to actually take a look at how we are going to do this, right? But self-management style, like 401k, to you know, lawmakers first, first, because they're the, they have to lead by example. They have to show that they can do it first so that other people can follow. So 401k style is recommended. And second of all, we have to also offer 401k style to new workers and also current employees. We have to offer them. And the four require all teachers to make contribution toward their own pensions. That's really needed. And five, and get the state out of the business of a managing, managing local school district pension. Uh, they have to take care of it, local you know, uh, district pension, not us, not state. I don't believe that this has to be out of our, our pockets. And uh, six, uh, we have to limit the, uh, the, um, some of the, uh, the age that when they're gonna uh, retire from, from, from this, from the work. So uh, that's about it. And then, and also they have to allow the bankruptcy, municipal bankruptcy, so that they can later restructure uh, their debts and renegotiate uh, contracts and reform pension. So this will reduce the amount of the debts, but this is not the full solution. But in order to do that, we ultimately, we have to, uh, mandate uh, Illinois Constitution will have to be amended so that the uh, state can enact will reforms. That's about it. Thank you so much for that thorough response. I do want to touch on something that you mentioned earlier, which was that we're seeing a lot of people leaving Illinois. So I believe over the last decade, more than 850,000 people have left for other states, and that's causing our state's population to shrink. In fact, over the six consecutive years, it has shrunk. What role do you believe the state plays in promoting job creation and economic opportunity to stem the exodus of people from Illinois? So because, you know, this country, uh, has a very good opportunity. Uh, we came to this country for freedom and also American dream. But right now, when you, our government try to tax some people, a lot of amount of money and business people suffer. And because of that, they cannot hire employee. So that's a big problem and we cannot do business in. And uh, Illinois is no longer desired place to work in and they decide to move out where they, can, they don't need to pay their income tax and the lower property tax. So they, they really want that. You know, but you know, because of debt problem, pension problem, it's all related to, to what I you know, already uh, answered, related to that, that because of debt problem, Illinois has to tax on people, but 
that I believe that's wrong. And that's what democratic machine has been doing so far. And it has to stop. And that's why tech action, I decided to run for office. And I'm here. That's why. Well, thank you. We really appreciate you being here. Um, the next question that I want to ask you about is currently we are living through a pandemic that has only worsened the social and economic inequities in our communities. Specifically, the health crisis has widened inequities for people of color and other historically marginalized communities. Earlier this month, Governor J.B. Pritzker and Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton announced the Healing Illinois Initiative in response to racial disparities. What other steps do you think the state should take, if any, to addressing the widening gap? Okay, a lot of people doing business, your community and my community and other communities, they have a business, food business, weather um, and engineering, architect, everybody has a job. Because of this pandemic situation, we are suffering, you know? But lawmakers, first of all, they raise their salary. And my opponents say yes on that, and I oppose it. And I think this is ridiculous. We have to stop this. People are suffering. They can't bring the food to their table. We have to stop this. And lawmakers really have to get awakenings that people really need job. And also they have to open the business because they, without the business and without our police protection, we cannot do the business, okay? It's not safe anymore and people are suffering. They have to know that who are going to take this responsibility, the lawmakers, okay? so. Lawmakers, we all want to make, you know, want to make a desired place to live in, but they, they have to show the action. So that's what I believe in. And in order to do the, uh, you know, do promoting the equality and the less discrimination, what we can do is that we can show uh, equal opportunity for people to do business in, in this strict district, a 17 district, because a lot of people are doing business and we have to show that the, our government is supporting them. Thank you so much for that. Um, the next question that I want to ask you about is one of the most contested items on the ballot for Illinois this year, which is the Illinois Allow for Graduated Income Tax Amendment, better known as the Fair Tax Amendment. Um, this amendment is a proposed amendment to change the state's income tax system from a flat tax to a graduated tax. This will correspond with higher tax rates for those with higher incomes. Do you support this measure and how do you justify your position? Okay, I believe this is misleading. Fair tax is not fair. Okay, flat tax 4.95% is fair because everybody is, you know, paying the tax according to what they're making. Even it's 10,000 or 100,000, you know, or 100, you know, uh, million dollars, it's there's paying sort of a taxes. But right now, when you take a look at it, they're saying that 97% uh, will less will have less tax. I do not believe this because when you take a look at this, uh, the, uh, right now, the 3% already paying 34% uh, of our tax amount. So I think that it's, it's a fair right now what we're having 4.95, but people really have to take a look at this bracket really well. When you look at this, it's really $20 of incentive, okay, what you're making right now. So they're saying that if you are making uh, $100,000 or between or and two hundred thousand dollars, two hundred fifty thousand dollars, you're you're paying four point nine five percent according to JB Prisker's uh, proposal. Uh, but right now, if you take a look at ten thousand between and then one hundred thousand, those people will pay four point nine percent, which is only point zero five percent of reduction. So, which is sixty five. The maximum is sixty-five dollars of uh, the tax reduction. Um, I, I do believe that that we 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 do not want to have this tax because what it does in in, in the future is that it will uh, the three percent will move out from the states, and then who's gonna pay all these tax because we have a pension debt, middle class and us. So. This is another open gate, you know, uh, gateway to tax on us. At, at this time, you say yes, they can, government has a power to tax on you. Anything in the future, they can change around brackets. So it will generate more problem in the future. And I will suggest people to say no on this because it's not fair and it's misleading. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, one of the next question is going to be, we're seeing a national phenomenon of increasingly polarized and partisan narratives on nearly every position. In Illinois, we have 118 members in the Illinois State House of various parties and ideologies. How do you plan to reach across the aisle to find common ground to come to agreements on critical issues that impact all of your constituents? Yeah, that's a really good um, question uh, because you know what? Uh, this is uh, one of my priority too because that because uh, right now when we vote on something, it's always like 90% above, always Democrat vote on one side and everybody else has to go that. We don't want that. They already set what they're going to pass they are pushing people to vote on yes. Uh, that's not right. In order to solve that kind of problem, bipartisan equally and fairly, and we need fair map, not fair tax, fair map, which is opposing gerrymandering. Uh, I believe that this will actually uh, uh, will make equitable redistricting that will represent our citizen and not either political party and we we can hear both sides equally so that's one of the key points that i want to pass once i get elected and i hope that we can change around thank you so much for this discussion i do want to invite you to take a, the next couple of minutes to share any closing remarks that you would like with our audience salam alaikum Shukran. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And I'm also first generation immigrants uh, from South Korea. Uh, I hear you. I know your pain. Uh, please uh, stay safe. And we need your value of votes. But sometimes what sounds nice, like a fair tax, doesn't mean that's right. So I hope you discern what is right and wrong and research it. And also don't go by feeling, but really look at the result. What they're bearing so far is a good fruit or bad fruit. If they're you know, bearing bad fruits, that means they're doing something wrong. I hope that you get awakenings and I hope you really vote for uh, right leader this time. And I, I'm, I need your support and your valuable votes. Please vote punch 42. Yes, so you're for state rep. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. Have a blessed day. Shukran. Ms. Yoon, thank you so much for joining us today. Finally today, we'd like to introduce candidate Christopher Kruger. Christopher Kruger is an anti-war civil rights and labor activist. He has lived in and near the 17th district his entire life. Chris has been fighting for ordinary citizens, homeowners, employees, students, and consumers against unfair and unjust practices for 16 years as an attorney. Prior to becoming an attorney at the age of 50, he spent 20 years in manufacturing as a factory worker and union, union representative. Christopher and his wife, Stephanie, have five children in a blended family. Chris's campaign accepts no donations from corporate corporations, lobbyists, or political action committees. Welcome, Mr. Kruger. Let's begin with the first question. Thank you. So our first question for you is going to be, if elected to office, what will be your top priorities and what is the most pressing issue that needs to be addressed by the governor or the Illinois legislature? Well, I, I did uh, have a, uh, an outline of topics that we discussed and one was headed priorities. And there's a, we have to begin of course with a sports analogy, right? So we're with a sports analogy, uh, Vince Lombardi, the coach of the Green Bay Packers, was famous for saying, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. And in American politics and in the American democracy at this moment, campaign finance isn't everything, it's the only thing. So until we are able to change our method, and unfortunately the Citizens United decision means that we're not gonna get any help from the courts in changing campaign financing, we're not going to get any help from the legislature. They're certainly not going to change their own uh, system of, of, of profiteering. We have to change it at the voters level. So only by voting for donor free candidates like myself, like uh, the Green Party and the recent experience of Bernie Sanders in the past five years being rather transparently cheated by the Democratic Party shows that being even a donor free candidate in a donor-based party isn't enough. We need true third party. So that being said, that's the first priority because we can't reach our priorities, nor can we reach, more importantly, your priorities. 
However, I will say that if we want to avoid a crumbling dysfunction of our infrastructure and of all of our uh, uh, services, governmental services, we do have to vote for the fair tax. And I know that's very hard for some people to swallow because so many politicians have wasted their money. I understand that. So at the same time, we need to pass ethics reforms concerning lobbyists, concerning former legislatures, enriching themselves at the, uh, uh, by the corporations that comprise their donors. And I'm running against a candidate who has raised $1.3 million in uh, three years to just be the representative of a, of a state representative district and receive $400,000 in one day from uh, Michael Madigan's allies. Despite the fact she says she wants Madigan to resign, what we need is for the donors to resign. Well, we have to leave them because they're not going to leave us. The voters have to accomplish this. Thank you. Thank you so much for that response. Our next question for today is going to be, Illinois continues down a path of unfunded pension liabilities with no easy solutions in sight. What should Illinois lawmakers do about it, if anything? And what specific steps would you take to control state's pension costs? Well, First, I'm going to push back a little bit against the premise because it says there's no easy solution in sight. In fact, there's an incredibly easy solution. The easy solution is to let the mega rich in the most richest society in the history of humankind pay their fair share to contribute toward this system that has made them immensely wealthy. And I'm not talking about the people in the district who are affluent people, accomplished people, people who do well. I'm talking about people who have nine and 10 digits after their uh, net worth. We're talking about that. So uh, it's easy to fix the pension crisis. It's, uh, to me, shocking that people would blame pensioners, state workers, teachers for the uh, uh, state's budget crisis. And the second thing I'd observe, and this is uh, uh, Kind of, kind of humorous, a state uh, politician is the very last person who knows anything about pensions, okay? Actuaries know about pensions. Actuaries are people who plan for insurance companies, for investment, they understand the time value of money, they understand currency uh, exchanges, they understand uh, equities, and those are the people who really solve the pension crisis. But we have to uh, begin to ask the people who have gained so much on the, on the hard work of the American people and of small business people, of working people, of professionals, of engineers, of uh, people who have worked. Uh, we need the uh, mega rich to donate just a little bit, just a little gratuity from the people who have prospered so much under our uh, free enterprise system. Thank you. So Thank you again for that solve, response. That's how we solve the, the pension crisis. <laughs> a simple solution like you had mentioned. Um, so our next question is going to be, over the last decade, thousands of Illinoisans have been leaving the state, which has caused the overall population to decline. What should the state do to promote job creation and economic development and stem the exodus of people from Illinois? When Illinois invests in people, people will invest in Illinois. Illinois should immediately make every one of its 48 community colleges tuition free. Illinois should roughly double, and I'm not a PhD in curricula, but I believe that we should greatly uh, strengthen our STEM education. And at an earlier age, we should have uh, more rigorous uh, math and science curriculum and support for those students who have been historically disadvantaged under our system. So I am uh, moving toward debt-free public education. Debt-free education doesn't mean people can't be of service, by the way. So we need free public universities in the near future. We can start by making uh, community colleges free right now. When we invest in our workforce, when we have a, a uh, a skilled and a trained workforce, and I include vocational and trade school in my uh, in that uh, category. 
then people will invest in Illinois. Then businesses will come to Illinois and we'll, we'll have innovation. We can lead in innovation as we did. You know, the uh, the first internet browser was invented at Champaign-Urbana at the University of Illinois. Public investment is what creates jobs. It's public, not private investment, is what creates jobs and creates innovation and creates uh, communities. So that's what we need to do. And we need to do it again by electing politicians who can have the political resolve. And that was part of actually my last answer that I, I, I should have got to. We need to resolve to fix the pension crisis. We need to resolve to uh, pass the fair tax. We need to resolve to make the public investment that we so desperately need in Illinois. Thank you. Thank you again for that response. Um, next, I'd like to ask you about financial and racial um, issues that we're facing at the moment. Currently, we are living through major challenges beyond the health crisis. We're seeing economic hardships, which are widening um, inequalities and inequities between people of color, um, and that's resulting in civil disorder. So what are steps that you think the state should be taking to address these challenges? Well, let, let's debunk a, a, a couple of, uh, of myth, myths or misplaced focal points. So we have a thing that I call the cops and statues um, syndrome, where the uh, media wants to focus on um, a, a uh, distraction. So the civil disorder is a result of economic insecurity. When you found a country based on economic insecurity, and you have a thing like the tragic events in Kenosha, Wisconsin recently, you can't be surprised because we've had a, a two parties dedicated to economic insecurity, first by gutting unions and, and, and labor rights and employment rights. Now the gig economy where people have no overtime, no uh, pension, no benefits, no insurance, we have a nation of 87 million people, at least now more with the COVID, of people who are uninsured and underinsured. So when you design a society premised on insecurity, you create the divisiveness, you create this idea of right versus left, which frankly, I find a false dichotomy. I think most people have the same interests. Most people are interested in helping their families. Most people are interested in having a, a job. Most people are interested in doing things with their life so um, I resist both of the narratives. Uh, another great example of how uh, the market can't serve every need. The market has not, for instance, served our journalism very well, hasn't particularly served our educational system very well, doesn't serve our healthcare system very well. So when you have a, a society premise on insecurity, what do you have to do? You have to create economic rights. We need economic rights, not means tested, like maybe the government will help us, maybe the legislature will convene and pass a COVID uh, a CARES Act, which ended up being a bailout, again, for the richest people. And by the way, these are premised on two uh, events that are important. And I, 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 if I go over just a minute, you'll pardon me very quickly. We have a two-party system that accepts a fallacy called the supply side economics theory. And supply side economics says incredulously that we should give the rich more money because they create jobs. And that's just not true. It's never been true. It was refuted in a very technical manner by the French economist uh, Thomas Piketty recently. And uh, we have that combined with Citizens United, which uh, uh, the wealthy can pour enormous amounts of money into campaigns. What we have to do is take this measure in our own hand, but we can't have a society founded on insecurity and expect to not have civil disorder and, uh, and chaos. That's why the fair test has uh, happened. That's why the ethics reforms have to happen. That's why people have to vote uh, for candidates like myself and the rest of the Green Party candidates who, who, who refuse these donations. Thanks. And I think, you know, you just hit it on our next question, actually, which is about the graduated income tax that is on the ballot for Illinois this year. 
Um, this is one of the most contested items, I think, um, in Illinois, and it's proposing that we change the state's income tax system from a flat tax to a graduated tax with higher taxes for those with higher income. Do you support this measure, which you answered, but for the record again, and how do you justify your position? Well, you justify your position by saying a person working at the um, state's minimum wage of uh, I think under eight dollars an hour, uh, four percent of his income is has a lot more impact on his quality of life than four percent of a of a billionaire's income. So uh, we think it's equitable uh, to uh, the people who are enriched, the people who are benefit by our system of free enterprise, which is not a right. The the free enterprise system is a, a grant from the American people. The free enterprise system, the right to make money, actually it's not a right, it's a privilege granted by the American people. And we cherish, and we cherish our freedoms. Let me tell you what a social democrat is, because people use the term democratic socialist. Um, the Greens use the term eco-socialist to indicate uh, the fact that we need enormous public investment to reverse climate change, and they talk about public investment. A social democrat, uh, which I consider myself, which I would say Bernie Sanders is, I would say Howie Hawkins, who is our presidential nominee is, I would stay, say people like all the way back to Jesse Jackson when he ran for president. A social democrat is a person who believes that in a democracy, when you have a policy decision and you have a tension between the rights of individuals and the rights of property, you favor individuals and you favor the welfare of the survival of individuals over the survival of property rights. So we need to uh, have a social democracy, meaning we can't have uh, five people own half the country. Thank you for that response. I, I actually want to jump back to a point that you had mentioned earlier um, in this conversation. And, you know, this is one of the last questions that I'll be asking you today. It appears that we as a nation are, you know, trying to hear and are hearing from those most polarized narratives of each party that are focused on very, again, polarized positions. In light of this, how would you reach across the aisle to find common ground to reach agreements on critical issues impacting all of your constituents? Well, the, the polarization is purposeful. And I did touch on that earlier with the, the cops and statues uh, narrative. When in fact, most people are not preoccupied with either. Most people have common interests. Only, again, by having the uh, latitude of being free uh, from the donor system, can you agree with uh, the other party? You know, I agree with uh, Republicans when I uh, uh, believe they're right. I think they have some great points about the supply chain. I think they have some great uh, ideas about bringing jobs. I think they have some uh, some good ideas, and I support uh, uh people on the right. I support uh, libertarian-minded people who are trying to restore so many of our civil liberties that have been lost in the last 20 years. Uh, I look at, at bipartisan efforts now um, between uh, right-minded and left-minded people to restore uh, civil liberties and freedom of speech. We have these narratives really because we uh, passed a thing in 1994 called the Telecom Communications Act. When they passed the Telecom Communications Act, there was 300 or 400 different television networks, newspapers, radio stations. Now we have six media monopolies and actually monopoly and anti-competitive um, trends in capitalism is also a, a entire area that needs to be explored. But that's why we have, we have a, a division because it's in their best interest to have that division. It's in their best interest to have what I call 50-50 issues, like for example, gun rights or reproductive health rights, which are 50-50 highly emotional issues compared with the 80-20 issues of universal healthcare, uh, good housing, affordable housing, 
free education to the 16th grade. Those are 80, 20 issues. And instead the media is incented because they're owned by the same people who uh, own the uh, uh, General Assembly and our Congress. And by the way, I do want to give one thing. It, there's a wonderful website called illinoisunshine.org. I think everyone hearing this uh, recording should go to illinoisunshine.org and look at Friends of Jennifer, that's my opponent's uh, committee, and you can download a, an Excel sheet that has every donation that she's received. And I want to emphasize, it's not her, she didn't invent the system, she didn't invent the donor, uh, the donor system, but it's eye-opening to see AT&T, Comcast, Exelon, um, Big Pharma, lobbyists, consultants, big firm attorneys, developers. That's who is governing the people of the state of Illinois. And this um, noise about civil disorder is really uh, uh, imposed on them by these two-party narratives. And they're really not getting to the root of our, of our common uh, interests. So in terms of coming across the aisle, again, only a donor-free party, donor-free candidate will have the latitude and the freedom to do that, and be empowered by the people to do that. Thank you, Chris, so much for, for that remark. Um, to close off today, I actually just wanna turn it back over to you and see if there were any closing remarks you'd like to share with our audience today. Well, the first thing I, I wanna do is I want to thank uh, the Ishmali community so much and uh, I got to say, um, uh, the invitation, um, I had two words uh, to describe it was as humbling and hopeful. And, uh, and I am uh, humbled and inspired by uh, your community's commitment uh, to civics. Uh, I think it's critical that uh, we understand, uh, and uh, I did support Bernie Sanders in the 2016 primary. And he is 100% correct when he says that change happens from the bottom up. Change happens from the ground up. And because of a, a number of, of uh, events, as an attorney, sometimes I trace things through uh, court decisions. You can look at the Citizens United decision. It actually started in 1976 as a case called Buckley versus Vallejo. And that is a, a uh, a thing that's stolen our democracy from us, from the campaign finance, the corrupt system uh, of, of uh, the two parties uh, has effectively removed democracy from the hands of the people. That combined with the anti-competitive uh, media monopolies, if you want someone who can fight and doesn't have one hand tied behind their back, if you want someone who can fight for universal health care, for, for education up to the 16th grade, a debt-free public education, for employment rights, for relief for small businesses, for, for fair taxation, and for efficient government that doesn't throw your money away, and patronage schemes, and payroll, ghost payrolling schemes, and how hypocritical to throw uh, the speaker under the bus and call for his resignation. When my question is, are the, are the donors going to resign? No, they're not. So getting rid of Speaker Madigan is not going to do anything to reform uh, the General Assembly. And people voting uh, in the Democratic Party uh, should be aware of that if they could cast their votes for the Democratic Party. The Republican Party should be aware also that I will favor uh, uh, policies of freedom policies of, of independence, policies of unfettered uh, self-expression, and uh, the ideals that uh, we've had in our uh, uh, country, and, I, and to resurrect uh, the ideals that the country was, uh, was brought up on. So I just wanted to thank you for this opportunity. Of course. Thank you again, Mr. Kruger, for joining us today. And with that, we'd like to thank all of our participants for being part of today's candidate forum. And now I'll hand it back for some closing remarks. Thank you, Representative Gong Dershowitz and candidates Yoon and Kruger for a truly insightful discussion. And thank you to our moderator, Noreen, for facilitating this session. Hearing your perspectives on these issues has been extremely valuable and insightful for the audience as we head to the polls. On behalf of the Ismaili Jamavkana and Center, we also wanna thank each and every one of you that joined virtually 
from across the United States and abroad. We hope that you found the program to be as valuable as we did. To get more information about the Ismaili Jamatkana and Center, please go to the .ismaili in your web browser. And for more information on upcoming programming, please go to facebook.com slash the Ismaili USA. We look forward to sharing future programming with you. Thank you.